Number five on this list is St. Mary's Catholic Church. This is a Catholic church in Nashville, Tennessee that is apparently deeply haunted. World on Fire says there are three ghosts rumored to haunt this church and its grounds. One story holds that a priest died during construction of the church. Another story claims that during the Civil War, a Catholic priest serving as a chaplain for the Confederate Army was shot and killed in the church. There's another rumor that the ghost is the spirit of Bishop Richard Pius Miles, the first bishop of Diocese of Nashville who died in 1860. He was buried in the church basement and supposedly still haunts his old stomping grounds. According to one story from 1937, a pounding at his bedroom door woke up a priest in the rectory, but he could find no one there. After he fell asleep, he was woken up again, this time by a pounding on the headboard of his bed. There was no one in his room, so the awakening was attributed to supernatural causes by superstitious locals. I can't say that I personally would substitute a ghost pounding on my headboard's wake-up call for a regular alarm clock, but hey, whatever gets you out of bed in the morning, right? Nowadays, the three ghosts that wander around here are sort of just part of the church and accepted among those who pray and worship here. Apparently these ghosts are relatively calm and won't cause too much trouble other than the occasional midnight stomping that is. There was however one story where the chaplain for the confederate army ghost attacked someone. It happened over 50 years ago now, but apparently a woman and her young son were walking past the church and got bombarded by this ghost. They both managed to get out okay, but they were obviously really shaken up. Now nobody knows why this ghost did this or what the story was, but we think that this woman and her son were descendants of someone who had dealings with him in real life. Potentially their grandfather killed this man or something along those lines. It's all a bit hazy, but the good thing is that's the only group of people his ghost has ever chosen to attack before. Other than that, these ghosts are just relatively annoying, but they shouldn't cause you too much problems if you go here. Number four on this list is the widow. There was a widow who lived in the 20th century who was a very devout Catholic. For some reason, this woman, who we're going to call Ruth, had a very strong connection to the spirits that were in purgatory. Her story goes like this. The first soul Ruth encountered was her departed husband. He had often been impatient during his bout with cancer and had reproached God. One evening, Ruth heard a voice. That happened almost every evening over a long time when she came in from the stable. Then she suddenly recognizes the voice of her husband, but she isn't quite sure yet. Then she kneels down and just prays the rosary. She recommends her husband in particular. Yes, she thinks. He was often rather impatient. Is that perhaps the reason he must still do penance? A few evenings later, she sees a nebulous apparition right in the middle of the room. She takes holy water and prays, O oh Lord, give him eternal rest. It makes her very upset, and then she sees her husband. He speaks quietly, Don't be afraid, Ruth, it's me. I may come here to ask your help. Pray three chaplets each day. And then he was gone. So every day she prays three chaplets. Each time she adds, Good God, forgive my husband his impatience when he suffered. After some weeks, her husband stands again in the middle of the room. He looks well. He's friendly and beautiful. She recalls how he was a young man. He says nothing. He only looks at her so grateful and full of love. Then she asks him, How are you, Jacob? He answers clearly and quietly, I'm fine, I may come soon. I thank you, Ruth, I thank you so much. And after this, he never appeared again. So that's a pretty famous story, and Ruth went on to interact with many ghosts like this in purgatory through her life. In fact, some people started to speculate that she may even be a ghost herself as well. Number three on this list is the Most Holy Trinity Church. Here we have another Catholic church that's meant for worship, but has been riddled by a haunting. World on Fire says there are a few possible origins of the hauntings that supposedly plague this old parish. One claims that the current church building, built from 1882 to 1885, stands over an old cemetery where 
where some bodies are still buried. Supposedly, the ghosts of the folk under the church haunt the building and mysteriously turn lights on and off, open and close doors, and walk back and forth. Or it could just be living people doing those things since those activities, believe it or not, are not limited to ghosts. The living can also open doors and turn on lights. At least they could last time I checked. Or maybe I'm a ghost and I don't even know it. Anyways, another source of the ghost legend is that one of the first pastors of the church, Monsignor Michael May, passed away in his bedroom and continues to haunt the church grounds. Apparently, visitors hear mysterious steps at all hours of the night, and dogs have been known to stare as if in a trance at the stairs and dining room of the rectory. In all honesty, dogs staring at things? Hmm, definitely not indisputable ghostly evidence. I mean, I've seen dogs do some weird stuff before, so I don't think that we can prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt based on their activities. However, it is very important to note nonetheless, whenever a big storm is coming, watch what your animals do. I bet that they'll go and hide or act differently right before a massive thunderstorm or a tornado or something. Us humans, we don't even notice it, we don't sense it at all, but they definitely will. This sort of weird sense, it also translates to ghosts as well, so maybe the dog really is seeing something from the afterlife at this church. Number two on this list is Annalise Michelle. This is a very sad story where there may not ever have been any ghosts involved, but they sure thought that there was. Wikipedia says, when Michelle was 16, she experienced a seizure and was diagnosed with psychosis caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. Shortly thereafter, she was diagnosed with depression and was treated by a psychiatric hospital. By the time she was 20, she had become intolerant of various religious objects and began to hear voices. Her condition worsened despite medication, and she became suicidal, also displaying other symptoms for which she took medication as well. After the taking of psychiatric medications for five years failed to improve her symptoms, Michelle and her family became convinced that she was possessed by a demon. As a result, her family appealed to the Catholic Church for an exorcism. While rejected at first, True priests got permission from the local bishop in 1975. The priests began conducting exorcism sessions and the parents stopped consulting doctors. Annalise Michelle stopped eating food and died of malnourishment and dehydration after 67 exorcism sessions. Michelle's parents and the two Roman Catholic priests were found guilty of negligent homicide and were sentenced to six months in jail as well as a fine. This might not be the most terrifying of all of the ghost stories on here, considering the only real ghost involved was the fear that everybody had to begin with. Poor Annalise would have went through absolute agony in her final days when there probably wasn't any paranormal activity to even begin with. And finally, number one on this list is St. Rita's Church. Several decades ago, there was one heck of a ghostly interaction that went down at this church. World on Fire says, on All Souls Day in the early 1960s, St. Rita's Parish had a ghostly visitation. More than a dozen parishioners had gathered there to pray when sometime in the early evening, the organ began to play by itself. Suddenly, six robed monks appeared, three wearing black and three wearing white. The parishioners attempted to flee, but they found the doors of the church were locked. The phantom monks moved towards the parishioners while the organ continued its dirge. Finally, the vision faded as a disembodied voice whispered, pray for us. So next time you see a ghost, it probably just wants to ask you a favor and hopefully not kill you. All they were asking for was a little prayer, which I think everyone would have been more than happy to indulge with at that time. Of course, having a bunch of ghost monks show up out of nowhere, lock all of the doors and keep you in there, that's pretty terrifying. Everyone is still very wary around St. Rita's Church in case these monks ever do come back. Kicking us off in fifth place, we have Water Park Troubles. This tale takes place at Schlitterbahn, which is a theme park owned by Cedar Fair in Texas on the Raging Rapids portion of the Lazy River. Our narrator Vanessa and her friends didn't expect anything intense from the ride. They were all just, you know, looking forward to relaxing, watching the water go by, enjoying the scenery. As expected, the ride wasn't super intense whatsoever at first, until it hit a patch of white water. And because of the angle that the raft hit the bump, Vanessa and her companions were launched into the river. Nope, that, that's not supposed to be part of the ride. Mm-mm. <laughs> And while the ride might have only been, you know, three feet or so deep of water, I'm reminded of all the posters from my local pool growing up about how people can literally drown in a bathtub. So, yikes. 
Vanessa described herself as entering a state of shock, feeling emotions ranging from fright to embarrassment, confusion, and panic. As she attempted to reach for the raft to pull herself back in, she realized she couldn't see her friends anywhere, and she was once again being yanked underwater. Panic had taken over as the main emotion by this point, and Vanessa found herself swirling around and around and around under the water. Thankfully, a nearby lifeguard jumped into action and was able to hoist Vanessa and her friends back into their raft, allowing them to enjoy the rest of the rapids in the intended fashion. I'm a little concerned about the lack of seatbelts on that ride since they were never mentioned, and I feel like that should be a thing, or like a weight sensor to stop the ride in an event that, you know, someone goes over. Oh, just me, okay. As a high point to this, somehow Vanessa managed to keep her glasses on throughout the entire ordeal. Go Vanessa! In fourth place, we have an urban legend from Canada's Wonderland. Time to move on to a Cedar Fair park that's a little closer to home. As someone who spends most of September through December at Canada's Wonderland every year, I just knew I had to include this ghost story in today's list. While Wonderland might be home to the scariest of scary monsters every October, the iconic Wonder Mountain is actually home to a ghostly spirit all year round. Construction of the iconic theme park happened between 1979 until 1981, with construction of the mountain alone involving a dozen local companies under Cincinnati engineer Curtis D. Summers. Now, while we don't know the name of our victim, one of the construction workers who was working on Wonder Mountain passed on the job, and for the most part, the details of his passing and specifics have been kept pretty secret. I tried. I promise I tried. This ghosty haunts the mountain to this day, specifically the Thunder Run ride. If the ride operators don't greet the area with good morning and good night at the beginning and the end of each operating day, the ride will malfunction and cease operations until given the proper respect. Honestly, I'm all for inviting the ghost to roam the park during Halloween haunt. What's the worst that could happen? An actual ghost over in Ghostly Pines or Spirit Manor would be so much fun to see. Oh, just my own opinion again? Of course. In third place, we have the Warner Brothers Jungle Habitat. Originally opening on July 19th of 1972, this now abandoned park closed its doors by 1976, which is a really bad timeline for a theme park that was technically never completed. The first time Jungle Habitat made headlines was only months after it first opened for business, when an Israeli tourist named Abraham Levy was riding through the safari in a taxi cab and decided to roll down the window to get a better look at some of the animals roaming around. Two lions attacked the car and mauled the 26-year-old tourist causing lacerations to his face and shoulder. He took credit for the harm, citing his own foolishness, which helped to dodge, I guess, like a media onslaught, for the most part. By the end of the year, reports of animals escaping into the wilds of West Milford, which is where the park is located, were far too many in volume to be ignored. Besides the sightings of harmless animals like peacocks, there were numerous rumors spreading about dangerous animals such as like a pack of wolves and a lion being sighted along like local roads. Okay, look, I grew up in the land of moose, and I wouldn't want to see one of those on the side of the highway. I can't imagine seeing a lion on the side of one. These sentiments voiced way back in the day are identical to the rumors still running rampant today. Tales told by local residents who have, you know, like looked out into their backyards include wandering ostriches and abandoned baboons running amok in the town's pharmacy. Guess they needed a prescription filled. Emus, baboons, and even wolves are just some of the uncaged critters which have been known to actually have escaped the park. I feel like I found the origins for the Night at the Museum franchise. On July 8th of 1974, a 68-year-old visitor from Long Island was grabbed by the trunk of a baby elephant, which then slammed her against a fence and bit her. The woman, um, her name's Elizabeth Ennis, by the way, was later awarded uh, 200,000 by a court. In an account in the New York Times, she claimed the elephant bit her on the right hand, and because of the trauma incurred by being slammed into the fence, she had persistent pain in her right side that prevented her from lifting heavy items. Her husband was awarded $5,000 for the loss of companionship. I'm just glad that's all that she went through. Goodness, elephants are pretty big. The animals also had a tendency to damage the cars that passed through. Any museum for the park that exists online now says that the tigers like to bite and pop car tires, and monkeys like to rip antennas off the cars. Sounds like a lack of good animal training and boundaries to me, but I'm no animal expert. Right after the park closed in October of 1976, some of the animal carcasses were left outside. This pile grew until, you know, 30 animal bodies, including that of um, an elephant, a bison, camel, and some zebras, were all left lying until April, when the ground had thought enough to finally bury what was left of them. The six months that they were left exposed was a violation of state laws, which stated that any animal should be buried within 48 hours of its passing. Despite this violation, 
Warner Brothers were not sanctioned. Jungle habitat is gone now, but never forgotten. Reports of mysterious kangaroo sightings in remote corners of West Milford still turn up from time to time. Be careful, kangaroos hurt. In second place, we have the Joyland Deaths. Located in Wichita, Kansas, Joyland once featured state-of-the-art rides and attractions, holding a reign of 55 years of fun and joy. Today, the once popular park is being reclaimed by nature, piece by piece by piece by piece. Joyland came into existence on June 12th of 1949. It was founded by Lester Ottaway and his sons, Herbert and Harold. Now, Herb had a passion for steam engines and race cars, and he refurbished both types of vehicles. By 1934, Herb Ottaway had refurbished a miniature steam locomotive and cars, and was traveling with them to county fairs in Kansas and Colorado. Joyland was originally opened to give Herb's refurbished locomotive a more permanent home. As the attraction became more popular, the Ottaways eventually added a number of different rides and games to the amusement park. Now, Lester Ottaway passed away in the mid-1950s, but his sons continued running Joyland until the early 1970s when they decided to, you know, retire. Joyland was then sold to Stanley and Margaret Nelson, who owned the park until it closed its doors in 2004. Joyland featured attractions such as a wooden roller coaster, my personal favorite kind of coaster, a wacky shack dark ride, a log jam, a sky coaster, bumper cars, the classic carousel, and of course, a Ferris wheel. Now on April 6th of 2004, a 13-year-old girl was enjoying a Ferris wheel ride with her friends when the restraint bar holding them in came undone. The young girl fell more than 30 feet, suffering multiple head, arm, and leg injuries, and it's a miracle that she survived. The Ferris wheel was immediately closed, while both private and federal investigations looked into whether everything was, you know, safe and up to code. The ride managed to, you know, reopen eventually after these investigations were wrapped up, so okay, I wonder what to code means anymore. Another notable ride at Joyland was the wooden roller coaster that was known as the Nightmare. Although the roller coaster was a staple at the amusement park, it too saw its fair share of injuries. On May 25th of 1977, one rider stood up in one of these carts and fell. He passed at the scene from injuries sustained from the fall. Another death occurred 20 years later on August 27th of 1998 when a 35-year-old maintenance worker named Kevin Briley was under the ride trimming the grass. He stood up and was tragically hit by the roller coaster. He also died at the scene from his injuries. My heart hurts telling that tale because I'm such a huge lover of traditional wooden roller coasters. There's just something about narrowly avoiding whiplash that I personally find thrilling. Joyland closed its doors in 2004. Maybe it might be worth, you know, a little urban exploration? In first place, time to visit the ghosts of the Enchanted Forest. The whimsical 20-acre amusement park was built in an Oregon forest and boasted handcrafted attractions like Storybook Lane and Toftville Western Town, along with rides like the Ice Cream Mountain bobsled roller coaster and a big timber log ride. Sounds pretty magical, right? Yeah, that all depends on who you ask. Though many folks experience nothing more than a charming park, other more normal experiences are definitely not in line with a regular amusement park. For many, a visit to the Enchanted Forest can be a supernatural phenomenon, and I know I'd be happy either way. I love all things fantastical and wonderful and whimsical, but also spooky. Tales of employees feeling a ghostly presence on attractions like the Haunted House and Challenge of Mondor ride caught my eye while doing research for today. The story of Enchanted Forest starts with Roger Toft, the park's creator, who spent every last penny he had to make his passion project come to life in 1971. His granddaughter, Ashley Toft, is now the park's general manager, and while she claims she's personally never experienced any supernatural phenomena on the Haunted House, she did admit that the attraction makes her feel anxious and overwhelmed. While guiding a group of experienced paranormal experts through the attraction, she led them directly to a cold spot that could be attributed to an otherworldly presence. As much as I understand the stigma of not wanting to believe in ghosts, that's a coincidence I can't just like ignore. Challenge of Mondor ride operator Chris Dunn has since told a tale of an inexplicable encounter that he experienced one morning in 2016 while prepping the wizard themed target aiming attraction for the day. He explained how he heard footsteps behind him, but turned around no one there. Mere seconds after hearing the footsteps, he described being hit with a strange energy throughout his body, one that made him dizzy and gave him a horrible case of chills. Now later in the day, the same thing happened, but with more intensity. He took photos of the ride not in operation and captured images of what looks to be an orb that changes shapes in three sequential photos. The two of the investigators I mentioned before were granted permission to spend a night unsupervised at the park and experience the chilling energy and the challenge of Mondor and managed to communicate with a spirit in the haunted house. Notice how I haven't mentioned like a park tragedy yet as the cause for anything? That's because unlike the other places on this list, there wasn't one. The haunted house was built during the original construction along with the rest of attractions, and Challenge of Mondor was constructed in 2006. Time to borrow that time machine I've been asking the powers that be for, and travel on back. In August of 1846, 
Oregon settlers and indigenous tribes of the Willamette Valley fought a terrible battle in present-day Salem, known as Battle Creek. The theory most people believe is that the energy could be the cause of the manifestation in the theme park, which was built in close proximity to the gruesome fight. You let me know what you think down in the comments. In at number 5, Nadab and Abihu burned alive. Nadab and Abihu were brothers chosen to serve the Lord as priests due to, due to their family having a rich pedigree. Their intensive preparation and dedication to serving God. However, when they chose to make an offering to the Lord, they did not know it would be their last. They dressed in their best robes and made their way to the altar to make an offering of incense. It was a known fact that they were forbidden to make unauthorized offerings to the Lord and it is unknown why they ignored this warning. Once their offering was made, a flame engulfed the altar and the brothers onlookers watched as they were burned alive. It is said that these deaths were to show the people that there are no sins too small. The brothers should have known that the incense was an unauthorized gift. Something to keep in mind next time you light some incense in your home. Which I never do, so I'm fine. No one's burning me alive, mother Coming in at number 4, John the Baptist is beheaded. Now this one starts with some Kardashian style family drama. John the Baptist had been imprisoned by Herod the Tetrarch for commenting that it was not right that Herod had divorced his wife Vassilus, so that he may take his brother's wife Herodias instead. John commented that it is not lawful for you to have her, which seems like a nice way of putting it. Herod has John imprisoned and was planning on keeping him there. The people saw John as a prophet and Herod didn't want to cause any upset. For his birthday he had a gathering where Herodias' daughters danced for all of the guests. This pleased him and his guests so much he made an oath to grant her anything she wanted. Prompted by her mother, she asked, bring me John the Baptist's head on a platter. Herod was disturbed by this, but he had to keep his oath. That evening, John the Baptist was beheaded in his cell. His head then brought on a platter to be presented to Herodias and her daughter in front of all of their guests. It is unclear what happened to the head after this, but that is some crazy revenge for gossiping about the family. That's why you should never gossip someone might cut out your tongue. In at number 3 we have King Herod eaten alive. Here is another example of someone upsetting God and paying the ultimate price. King Herod, a different Herod from the last story, was giving a speech to his people as he usually does. On this day however, while he was speaking, someone cried out, the voice of God and not of a mortal. He did not repute the claim that he was a god and it is said that he was instantly struck down by an angel. Angels are savage. We've learnt this on this channel. They're evil. The story goes on that he did not have a quick death. He was in agonizing pain for at least seven days. It's like it took God seven days to build the world. Wow. Seven's a good number. Like David Beckham. He was number seven. Not that I believe in God, you know. I don't believe in anything. During this time, it is said he was being eaten alive by worms from the inside out. The worms consumed him after seven days, and this was his slow, painful cause of death. Imagine a worm consuming you. Worms are evil because you can cut them in half, and then they are two worms. That's f You just created two different things. Two worms. When two become one. When one becomes two. Like, what the f that's, that shouldn't be right. Like you can't, you should never be able to cut something in half and then it becomes two living things. Anyway, that's f and it's worse than the conjuring. <laughs> In at number 2 we have concubine of a Levite. This story is about a Levite who is travelling with his concubine, a second class wife. Sucks. Imagine being the second class wife. I only want to be first class. Along his travels, he finds an elderly man who offers to give them shelter for the night in the town of Gibeah. It is a dangerous place no one should be traveling through. Some dangerous men show up at the house looking to have a good time. The Levite and old man decide to offer up the concubine to appease the men, hoping this will keep them safe from the men. The concubine is taken away by the men for the rest of the night. In the morning, the Levite finds the concubine dead outside of where he had been staying. The man is angry for what they've done to her, so he decides to get revenge on the men, so he dies them up. He then sends those pieces to 12 tribes surrounding Gibeah which leads them to attack the city. Dicing your girlfriend up to get revenge on her murderers doesn't seem like the best idea but then again he did offer her up to them in the first place. So you're in the wrong. You should be in the conjuring and I'll possess you. And finally in at number one we have Ezekiel's army of the dead. This next one might remind you more of the walking dead than a bible story. Ezekiel was brought by God to a valley that was full of bones. He walked back and forth among the bones until God asked him if these bones could once again live. God then told him to repeat a prophecy to the bones as he told him it. The bones started to move from around him. They began to form and find the other pieces of the body they had lost. Tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them but they were not breathing, they were not alive. 
alive. He then told him the final words to speak and the dead began to wake up and breathe once more. God told him that these are the people of Israel who had been killed. He was bringing them back to take their rightful place back in their land. Ezekiel then had a full undead army to take back their land which they had lost. Number 5 Our first story, and not to give away too much of the plot here, but a lot of the other stories, came from a reddit thread positing the question, what's your scariest home alone story? There were many good ones, but the literal top comment was this by Killer or Angel. It was an average night around 9pm. Me and my cousin are at his house and I'm sitting for the night while my mom and aunt are shopping and my dad and uncle are at the movies. We're just sitting there feeling strange. Something was wrong, but I couldn't really put my finger on it. I got up and walked to the back door to lock it. When I came back, I saw what was causing that weird feeling. In the window there was a decrepit and homeless looking man just staring into the window looking at us. My protector instincts turned on. I pretended I didn't see the guy and I told my cousin it was time to go to bed because it was too late. I took him upstairs knowing damn well there was a man outside that wanted in. Now at the time I was 5 foot 8 and only about 125 pounds. I did play football at school though. If I remember correctly, I went downstairs to grab a meat tenderizer and I turned back to the window. He wasn't there. I ran to the front door and made sure it was locked and then I ran back upstairs and went to my cousin and sat down in front of the door. He asked me what was happening and I told him it was nothing to worry about, that he should just get some sleep. I called the cops and then my dad. The cops said they were half an hour away and my dad was 45 minutes away. I heard a window shatter and the sound of boots. I told my cousin to stay completely silent and hide under the blankets. It was horrifying. I grabbed the tenderizer and waited. About 5 minutes passed and I hear the boots walk upstairs. I heard him opening the doors to my aunt and uncle's bedroom, then the bathroom. I heard him make his way to the basement. After what felt like forever, the cops burst in, kicking the door in, and got the guy. Turned out, he was an escapee from a mental hospital a full province away. That's literally like the plotline to a horror movie. Absolutely terrifying, but good on him for having that big cousin instinct and making sure that the cousin was safe. And if you're looking for more freaky stories in this sort of vein, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. If you want something else a little spicier, than scary stories. We got aliens, cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, anything freaky. We've done a video or two on. So hit subscribe. Please hit that little bell so you don't miss a scream. But would you kindly do that at the end of this video? Because I got four more scary Home Alone stories coming up for you right now. Number four. It's another post from this same thread asking about people's scary Home Alone stories. This one very likely is going to have you locking the door tight and probably spending the night with the blankets pulled all the way up to your eyes. I had just moved into my first apartment. It was around 8.30 p.m. and I heard the doorknob moving like somebody was putting a key in it and turning and knocking. At first, I got pretty excited that my at the time boyfriend was home, but then I realized that it was too early in the day. He usually came home nearer to 11 and it was only 8.30 still. So I looked outside at the kitchen window and I didn't see his car or anyone's car that I recognized parked outside and that's when I started to panic. The doorknob kept moving for a few more seconds and then stopped. A few minutes Minutes later, they had some piece of metal that they were sticking between the door to try and open the door. I freaked out and I locked myself in the bathroom. I grabbed a blade from the kitchen to try and protect myself. I called the cops. Whatever was on the other end was trying to pry the bathroom door open for about three full minutes before they stopped. Interrupting the story a bit, can you even imagine how horrifying that would be? Three minutes locked in your bathroom waiting for the boys in blue to arrive while someone's clawing at your door? This person is braver than I. For context, this video has been about four minutes up to this point. Imagine the entire video you just watched, but you're petrified and shaking in a bathroom. Anyway, back to the story. Eventually the cops came in and they found an elderly man roaming my apartment with a crowbar. He used to live in my apartment and he wanted a bunch of stuff back that we took when we moved in. Police told me he was delusional. I'm so thankful and glad I didn't answer to the door. To this day, my heart still skips a beat when someone knocks on my door. And mine too, I don't think I'm opening my door for strangers anytime soon. Number 3 I was home alone and my parents were out of town. We just moved into the house, so there was an empty lot next to the house with a half built house on it. My parents were the types to always leave the door unlocked. While they were gone, I was watching TV when all of a sudden, the door that leads into my garage from the inside starts to wiggle. I put my TV on mute to listen and I see it move this time. I start freaking out and I'm kind of in shock looking for the phone. I can't find the house phone, so I search for myself. I remembered I I left my charger in my parents car so now I am frantically looking for the house phone. Our house was 
pretty new. So my mom hadn't even put blinds or drapes up in the kitchen or living room. Again, no blinds, no phone. Whoever was wiggling the doorknob starts banging on the windows in the living room. I shoot upstairs looking frantically for the phone and also trying to figure out how and where I'd jump out of my house to get away from the maniac that's probably outside my door if I needed to. He then starts pounding on my door. I can tell at this point that he's using something metal or plastic by the sound of the thumps. I genuinely thought he was going to shoot my door open. I remember it that because I was mad at myself for being such a fool. I freaked I frequently talked on the phone and I always just left it lying around. I never put it back on the base. I wanted so badly to push the button to detect where my house phone is, but I thought if he heard where it was, he'd break the window near it and take it. I then remembered. I left the phone in my mom's room. And as I passed the hallway, I see her dad's old weapon in my parents' bedroom, a long arm. I find the phone and I call 911. As I'm on the phone, the window breaks. I'm upstairs and I am scared to death and suddenly everything goes silent. I'm waiting in my parents bedroom, pitch black closet for what seems like eternity. I hear the sirens. Cops show up but there's no one to be found. I figured they hadn't gone too far since the incident had just occurred, but the cops never found my tormentor. On the plus side, the company that built the house next to us hired overnight security for the house, which was definitely refreshing. Number 2 In fall 2016, I moved into half of a really old house. It was built in the 1880s, a stone's throw from the original campus of Indiana State, which is now a park filled with homeless people. The owners basically turned it into a weird duplex kind of deal. Anyway, the layout of this house was pretty weird. You walked in the door and you were in a living room type space and then you kept walking and there was a doorway to a bedroom and past that was the kitchen. No doors. Only door inside the apartment was to the bathroom and one that led to the shared basement. This is a terrible living situation, may I say. My first night there was uneventful. I was kind of uncomfortable because I hadn't lived by myself in a long time and I was just sort of feeling lonely and on edge. I stayed up late and eventually fell asleep but woke up around 3 in the morning. Cliche, I know. What woke me up? sounded like a group of drummers were drumming on every flat surface of the living room. It went on for a while and I was completely terrified. It was just a cacophony of sound. After about two or three minutes, I finally gathered up the courage to get up and check on it. And as I soon as I passed the threshold to the living room, it just stopped. Nothing happened the rest of the night, but I didn't get much sleep at all. A couple of days later, my friend was visiting and he was about to leave. We were standing by the front door to my bookshelf and I told him about how I was having trouble sleeping. And I told him that story about my first night there. As I was saying this, a book threw itself off the bookshelf and onto the floor three feet away. It had to fly past the dresser the shelf was perched and landed between the two of us. He just gave me a creeped out look and said, I have to go and I don't blame him. Eventually, I asked the guy in the other half of the apartment what was up, as he'd lived there for eight years. He told me that no one stayed longer than a year and they all reported the same stuff. For whatever reason, he said nothing ever happened on his side. Doesn't make sense, but there it is. And sometimes, you just don't get the answers and that's way scarier. And number one, do you remember your first job? Mine was a newspaper route. Maybe yours was like a grocery store clerk or a babysitter. This next tale is a tale of babysitting gone deeply wrong. Perhaps one of the most infamous home invasion stories in American history is the babysitter killings in 1978. Lauren Strode was a young woman looking to take on a bit of responsibility and earn some spare pocket cash for the upcoming summer. She and her friends had a bit of a sitter's club. On October 31st, 1978, Strode was looking after Tommy Doyle, a neighborhood boy while his parents were out, alongside friends Anne Brackett and Linda Vanderklok looking after one Lindsay Wallace. It seemed like it would be a fun night like any other in a sleepy town. Town. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to the girls, earlier that week a mental patient from Smith's Grove Sanitarium nearby had escaped containment and was on the loose and suspected to be around the Haddonfield area. A quiet investigation being led by Sheriff Brackett, Anne's father, and a psychiatrist at Smith's Grove was underway to try and apprehend the patient, who had been incarcerated after killing his sister years ago in a fit of unprecedented terrifying violence. The patient had disguised himself and was stalking the streets of Haddonfield and had come across Strode out of a psychotic obsession. He stalked the girl for days until eventually making his move, and then proceeded 
proceeded to invade the home of Linda Vanderklok and strangled her alongside boyfriend Bobby Sims. Strode protected the youth she was looking after, and thankfully both Tommy Doyle and Lindsay Wallace were not harmed in any way, and boldly attacked the invader with a knitting needle, subduing him long enough for authorities to arrive, where he was apprehended and returned to Smith's Grove Sanitarium, where he remained for 40 years. Strode remained in Haddonfield, where she lives quietly and would prefer not to be disturbed looking after her daughter and granddaughter and does not celebrate Halloween much anymore. In fifth place, time to visit a haunted house. Our lovely narrator Claire was familiar with the family, with her mom having taught the would-be clients in preschool, and was asked to cover a shift whenever the regular sitter was unavailable. Over the course of one evening in particular, four odd things happened. Let's count them down, shall we? First, the boys were pulling out food for dinner, and they set a container of salsa on the counter. Minutes later, while prepping food, the container burst and sent salsa flying all across the room, all over the walls, the cabinets, and the fridge. Odd, but Claire assumed it was just kind of old and some gas had built up in the container. I can't imagine that was fun to clean. Well, while she was cleaning it and the boys were in the kitchen helping her, they all heard a loud thud in the living room. Rushing as a group into the other room, they saw that two framed photos on opposite walls had fallen to the floor at the same time. Neither of them appeared damaged, but they both landed right on the floor. Claire propped them up against the walls, but left them alone. Weird. Later, when the entire posse was upstairs, Claire was waiting in the hallway while the boys took turns in the bathroom taking their evening showers, and suddenly she heard a weird dinging sound. She walked down the hallway and noticed that the computer in the study was turning on and off and making all sorts of weird noises. Sure, there are explanations for that, but after all the other events, Claire was very much on edge, and rightfully so. She finally got the boys to bed and went downstairs to watch TV for the rest of the time until the parents got home. As she was sitting in the living room, trying to relax her racing brain, she heard footsteps upstairs. And that's number four. Assuming the boys had gotten up, she tiptoed upstairs to check. Their bedroom door was closed, and when she peeked inside, both boys were fast asleep in their beds. Claire went back downstairs, and within minutes, she heard the creaking yet again. The boys never called out to her, and there wasn't any noise besides that. She didn't report anything else weird happening, but I would recommend a deep spiritual cleanse of the house if I were that family. Just my two cents. In fourth place, we have a case of moving dolls. As someone who collects creepy dolls, this story definitely intrigued me from the get-go. Here's the thing with dolls with a personality, okay? They have to be treated with respect, carefully preserved, and be in a quasi-emotionally stable environment, or else weird things are, um, they're gonna happen. Don't worry, I promise a video on my personal creepy doll collection is coming soon. I'm just waiting on one of them to be ready to take a day trip to be on camera. It's a whole thing, but we respect boundaries. Oh, uh, where was I again? Oh, right. Poor Ashley. She arrived at the Lanford house one night, ready for what she thought was a typical babysitting evening. Upon encountering Sarah, mother of Kelly, she realized that poor Kelly was indexed within an inch of her life. Sarah had prepared a thoroughly detailed binder of everything Ashley would ever need to know about Kelly and more. From a tab explicitly spelling out Kelly's allergies, to her every phobia, each show she was allowed to watch on TV and when they'd be on, and more. It took a while for Ashley to scoot Sarah out the door, but when she did, Ashley breathed a sigh of relief, wondering if the night was gonna be an easy evening, or what the heck had she gotten herself into? Going through the binder herself, she observed that it was indeed supper time, in accordance with the minute accurate schedule, and began following the precise instructions, prepping the water pot to boil. I would never be able to follow a minute schedule. No, thank you. While well, she waited for the water to, you know, do its thing, Kelly offered to introduce her to the dolls that were in the living room, and Ashley happily accepted, hoping to figure out if the, you know, the ward was genuinely neurotic or just a poor victim of extreme helicopter parenting. Kelly introduced Ashley to each doll in great detail, and then began to act out scenarios, pretending as if the dolls were alive and out to hurt her. Now look, I'm not gonna pretend I was a normal kid, but I don't think I put my Barbies in a scenario to like end my life. I'm thinking, yeah, I don't think so. Poor Ashley ran for the binder, flipping through the phobia and usual behavior sections in an attempt to see if there was a way to placate the situation, when suddenly, Kelly stopped, as if nothing had happened. Ashley tried prompting her, seeing what had taken over, but nothing. By this point, the pot in the kitchen had finally reached a boil, and Ashley turned her attention to making dinner, hoping that sticking to the schedule would avoid any further weird behavior. After supper was over, and Kelly was watching one of the pre-approved shows on the list, Ashley noticed that some of the dolls that were previously in the display case had disappeared, 
and she couldn't find them anywhere in the house. Kelly hadn't left the first floor of the home while Ashley was making dinner, so she couldn't just run off with them. She tried to shrug it off, but the weird thoughts continued to plague her mind, and rightfully so. It wasn't until later, when the duo was upstairs, that Ashley found one of the dolls hanging upside down from a painting that was way too tall for Kelly to reach in any way. And parts of another throughout Kelly's room while trying to put her to sleep. Ashley was thoroughly terrified at this point, and yeah, ditto. And when Sarah arrived home, bolted from the house as quickly as she could. The next morning, she woke up at home, in her own bed, with the last of the missing dolls next to her. She mailed it back with no return address, and refused to ever enter the Lanford home ever again. In third place, we have a scream knockoff. While Taylor was in her last year of university, she was determined to make extra money and decided to post ads online for babysitting and dog walking services, adding photos of herself and her phone number in an attempt to appear as legitimate as possible. Roughly an hour after finalizing her posting, Taylor was cooking herself dinner and heard her cell phone ringing from where she left it in her upstairs bedroom. Sadly, she couldn't retrieve it immediately since, you know, she was handling a lot of hot pans so she let it ring out. A few minutes later, it began to ring again, and when she didn't retrieve that call either, whoever it was called back, and repeatedly, until she was finally able to leave her pans and bolt upstairs to answer it. When she picked up, all that she could hear was heavy breathing, so after she didn't get a reply, she hung up, but the phone rang again the moment she put it down. Annoyed by this point, and I would be too, Taylor picked up once again, this time finally encountering a male voice. The conversation began normally, so, Taylor assumed that the call before was just a bad connection. He explained that he had a duo of very young offspring and wanted to know if she thought she could handle that responsibility. Taylor informed him that she had experienced dealing with poorly behaved clientele before and assured the man that she could handle what he was describing. The man followed up by asking if she could do any overnights, and this is where the uh, red flag started to kick in for Taylor. Dang, I should have brought one today with me to uh, count them off. Oh well, just imagine it, right here. Whee! Thanks to common sense kicking in, she firmly said that she would not babysit overnight and was met with only heavy breathing in response. She asked if he was still there, and after a period of silence, the voice asked, are you a virgin? Taylor, completely stunned, hung up the phone immediately. The phone kept ringing nonstop for the next hour. The alpha man had withheld his number, so she couldn't specifically block that number at first, but then eventually found the function to block withheld numbers on her phone, did it, deleted her number from the ad site, and went on to message every other person on there in her local area with a babysitting ad to warn them. Finding out that this caller was a common annoyance or rite of passage to those who had listed their numbers. Poor Taylor was so scared that she was jumping at every shadow for the rest of the evening. In second place, we have the end of a life. Sheila Schrock was a teenage orphan who lived with her older brother in Birmingham, Michigan, an attractive and affluent community. Sheila was babysitting in an upstairs room of a house at 1772 Villa Street early in the evening of January 19th of 1976 when she was surprised by a man who had just come from breaking into three other houses in the neighborhood, holding a pry bar and a screwdriver. Her assailant, described by a witness as a thin young white male, somewhere between the ages of 18 to 25, around 5 foot 10 or 6 feet, with a sparse beard, prominent nose, pointed chin, uh, removed her clothing, forcibly fornicated with her, and as this horrified neighbor witness watched from a nearby roof from which he was shoveling snow, ended her with a series of shots from a semi-automatic. Hmm, that's specific. Allegedly, the attacker looted the home, making off with a firearm, jewelry, and blended in with the crowd on the street to escape. The eyewitness described the vehicle as a 1967 Cadillac, and even with all this detailing, he has never been apprehended. Poor Sheila. Like, that is such a specific remembrance of somebody's face, and even with all that, you can't apprehend him? Dang. In first place, we have a complete kidnapping. On October 24th of 1953, Viggo Rasmussen, a professor at La Crosse State College in Wisconsin, hired Evelyn Hartley, the daughter of a fellow professor, to take care of his own very young daughter. That evening, Evelyn's father Richard called the Rasmussen house several times after she failed to check in as planned around 8.30 p.m. and was met with no answer each time. Concerned, he drove to the house, and when he arrived, the doors were locked, the lights and radio were on, and items were scattered all over the house. The living room furniture had been moved around to different places, ditto for Evelyn's school books. Richard found her shoes in different rooms, with one shoe upstairs and another downstairs. He also found his daughter's broken glasses upstairs, but no sign of his actual daughter anywhere in the home. During the search of the house, Richard observed that every room that could be locked was in fact locked, minus a basement room at the back of the house that had an opened window that was missing a screen. The missing screen was located outside of the room in the backyard, leaning against a short step ladder. Pry marks were found on some of the windows, and footprints had been found in areas of the house, along with traces of um, red fluid, leading to red handprints, on the garage that was over 100 feet away. Oddly enough, the charge Evelyn was watching was still fast asleep and unharmed. Police 
believe someone took Evelyn through the yard, but dropped her on the ground before carrying her further. And this was supported by the police dogs who tracked her scent trail that ended two blocks away, where it's assumed that she was tossed into a vehicle, just like a sack of potatoes. They were told by one neighbor that they had seen a car repeatedly driving around the neighborhood, and another person who lived nearby claimed they had heard screams an hour earlier, assuming it was just from local kids playing. Now, before anyone calls out nonsense on that, have you heard kids playing in the neighborhood? That gets loud. Two days after the incident, local resident Ed Hoffer told police that while driving his vehicle, he was almost hit by a dark green, two-tone 1942 Buick as it was speeding in a westerly direction. So for me, I'm like, okay, green car? Inside the Buick, Ed reported seeing one man was driving the vehicle, while a second man was in the backseat with a girl. Ed also reported that a few minutes before the incident, he had seen the same two men with the young girl as he was pulling outside his brother-in-law's house, located conveniently around the corner from the Rasmussen house. Ed stated that the girl Girl was wedged between the two men, and he had thought that she was, you know, intoxicated, as the two men were holding her by the arms as they were walking down the street. Now, if you think this all sounds a little too suspicious and made up, you're not alone. The police did bring in Ed as a suspect, but sadly, he passed two lie detector tests, and no remains or DNA were found on his property. Some folks, such as um, myself, are pretty sure he had something to do with all of this. Several days after that fateful night, various items of clothing, many of which were stained with red, were found at different locations, and tests proved that the red stains matched Evelyn's DNA. Over a thousand members of the local community, including law enforcement officers, the National Guard, Boy Scouts, and lacrosse state college students and faculty, participated in a search. A vehicle inspection program was also undertaken with the intent of searching every vehicle in La Crosse County. Gas station attendants were asked to check cars for red stains, and recent graves were reopened to determine if Evelyn's remains were placed with a recent burial. In May of 1954, mass lie detector tests were conducted on La Crosse area high school boys in an attempt to find out more information about Evelyn's disappearance. Though local authorities had planned to test, you know, 1,750 students and faculty, the testing was controversial and was halted after around 300 were tested. And to this Stay. No clue what happened to Evelyn. Number five, the human experiments. Now, one of the more infamous stories that has come out of the dark web is the human experiments. Now, that name alone should already tell you this is not going to be a fun one. I can't think of any fun human experiments. The site was active for a while, but possibly, thankfully, seems to have gone dark around 2011. The human experiments refers to a website where a group of anonymous doctors, medical students, and so on practice their own brand of medicine. And if the website's header is to be believed, they hope to to prove that not all humans are equal, for some of them were born superior to others. So who's behind it? Government black ops, super soldier project, freelance doctors looking to practice on their own time, an incredibly convoluted and overly complicated hoax? Could not tell you. Eh, probably for the best. I don't really know if I want to know. They say that their clientele mostly consisted of the homeless population, presumably not to arouse too much suspicion. Now Their experiments range from all sorts of dealings, some on the website lists that are starvation and water fluid restrictions restriction, vivisection and pain tolerances, infectious diseases and organ effects, transfusions, drug trials, sterilizations, and I'm sure some more that aren't listed. I feel like I'm reading off the side effects for a drug commercial. Apparently if any of their test subjects don't survive their experiments, the bodies would be dissected for further study and dumped discreetly in dumpsters around the city. Now like most dark web stories out there, there's obviously a fair bit of scrutiny, with some people suspecting this might be a very elaborate grisly hoax. Why someone would go to this much effort to fake something that most people aren't even going to see, I'm not sure. However, one reporter noted that the test data on the website of the hypothermia and bleach injection experiments are eerily convincing. So either it's a fake and someone did their homework or I don't really want to think about it. And hey, if you're just looking for really good scary stories, you don't got to go any further than where you are right now. Just hit a subscribe and we'll get you a scary video or two every single day. Let's keep going. Number four, the Red Rooms. One of the most reoccurring dark web urban legends as well is that of the Red Rooms. What is a Red Room, you ask? Well, it refers to an alleged secret streaming service or website where viewers can pay massive sums of money, usually cryptocurrency, to watch live streams of the darkest things imaginable to the human psyche, uh, being able to make special requests for what they'd like to see. Much like the VIPs from Netflix's Squid Game, if you watched that, and I'm sure most of you did, who all travel to that mysterious island to pay to watch the games up close and personal, this is allegedly that on a much smaller personal scale, where you wouldn't even have to dress up in an ornate animal mask and fly out to South Korea. Now, it's worth noting that there's some discrepancy as to whether or not these horrifying red rooms really 
exist or if it's an exaggerated story like a digital campfire legend. The browser used to access deep and dark web content is too slow to run a live stream properly and alternative browsers struggle as well as they run their traffic through multiple services. That's not to rule it out entirely. The, the web beneath the surface is a wild wasteland and there have been de deeply disturbing real stories from the dark web of criminals charging uh, for pay per view videos of dark acts. So who's to say? I'm not about to crawl through the dark web anytime soon to find out. Number 3. Swatting Now for those of us who aren't on the internet as much, maybe you aren't super familiar with this term swatting. It has nothing to do with flies, but instead refers to the practice of obtaining a victim's IP address and then anonymously or falsely reporting serious criminal activity at the location, such as a bomb threat hostage situation or any other number of things that would necessitate the boys in blue packing up, getting in the van and kicking down your door. The SWAT team shows up, kicks the front door down, ready to go and tragically more often than not it ends poorly and it happens to be a huge trend. It's even happened to celebrities like Justin Bieber and Rihanna. One of the biggest targets is gamers and streamers getting locked in vicious rivalries. Well, like many other illegal services, swatting is allegedly something you can buy through the dark web. Worried about the consequences? Don't want to spend money on an expensive trial for going to jail? Well, apparently you can hire someone to SWAT for you. One alleged website offers tiers of service ranging from mild situations to a little worse. They'll bring many people and raid them all the way to the lofty. The SWAT team comes and from there they'll do anything. Now despite huge sentences for swatting, up to 25 years to life by the way in case you're wondering, it's still a fairly common occurrence. Disposable phones, encrypted phone numbers and even Skype have all been tools for the would-be swatter. As such, various law enforcement agencies across the United States have been trying to crack down on the practice as much as they can in order to dispel any would-be swatters from getting any bright ideas and to dispel any more tragedies from occurring. Number 2. Bed bugs. This one is really out there. But I'm going to be honest, it's the ones that are really out there that are the ones I'm most interested in of course. I want to bring you the stuff you probably haven't seen in any other top 5 videos and this was too good to pass up. On a reddit thread asking plainly, what's your dark web story? We had this from user urbanhawk1 who said that in his time on the dark web he saw all manner of nefarious business but none that truly stuck out to him more, none that was stranger than one man who is trying to acquire a massive amount of bed bugs shipped to his home. Naturally people on the marketplace website were a bit Curious. Other users on the unknown website wanted to know why exactly you'd invite that sort of thing into your home. Most of us want that out. Well, the bug collector was looking to and paraphrasing the original redditor's words. He wanted to try to breed bed bugs to be resistant to all the usual manner of extermination while simultaneously breeding in a weakness that would remain secret to only him. From here, he would then unleash his genetically superior bed bugs onto the unsuspecting population who would then have to pay him to have it dealt with since he was the only one who knew their weakness. Now if this one is sounding just a tiny bit comic booky to you, that's because similar schemes were also the plot of the villains of the Amazing Spider-Man movie and the Michael Bay Ninja Turtles. Now un unfortunately there's, there's no follow up to this, I couldn't really find a second source on this anywhere and Urban Hawk's story is the only time I ever saw this particular anecdote mentioned but it was too interesting to pass up. You have to wonder, maybe Urban Hawk the guy who posted about it. Maybe he was the bed bug mastermind looking to see if there was any interest in the business. We may never know, but I'm definitely feeling itchy just talking about it. And number one, we see you. Our next story comes to us from a Reddit user going by the handle fake fakington. So all that being said, maybe just take whatever he says with a grain of salt if that's how he chooses to advertise. Making matters more confusing, he does list his real name on his Reddit account as Truth Real Time. So who's to say? Now Truth Fakington, Fake Truth, he recounts the story of the early days of the dark web when everything was still very deep and dark. Back in the day, Fakey Truthy was browsing random links just like us kids today still do. He describes a lot of it as not particularly interesting until he found sort of an early blog describing random thoughts, musings and so on. But he said they felt a bit like someone was trying to pass secret notes to each other. So curious, he wanted to know more about what he was reading and he compiled the IPs from the various messages and writings to try and get a better understanding about what he had found. Now he said he made his way through a digital rabbit hole 
to find himself in a collection of medical records. Uh, the sort of thing that a psychologist or a therapist might keep perhaps. The images were mostly of faxes and predominantly medical but also military in nature too. As he was browsing through all of the files he had just uncovered, he noticed a new one had uploaded as he was browsing through them. The timestamp on the upload listing the exact minute he was browsing. The message was named spine chillingly, hello there. Infinitely braver than I would be. Mr. Fake Truthington opened up the file and saw that it was nothing but plain text that read out, We see you. And about 15 seconds later, the server dropped all together. Now, Fake Fakington is still around today. He's still an avid Redditor and tech head and was able to bring us this story. But no doubt that one little incident probably kept him awake for a few nights and probably kept him away from the dark web for a bit. I know I would. Number 5 Walking Dead. My first true tale of phantasmic terror comes to us from Reddit user Jowkai. Answering a question posed in the thread, Nurses and doctors of Reddit, what's the weirdest and most paranormal thing you've ever experienced? Hospitals already seem pretty haunted as is, so it's no surprise that there was so many good answers. But Jowkai stood out. Take a listen. I'm a psychiatric nurse, and early on in my career, I worked at a residential mental health facility. One of our residents was an elective mute, which means that he didn't talk, but there was no medical reasoning as to why. He had spoken earlier in his life, and in fact seemed quite normal back then, with the exception of being close to 7 feet tall. He'd been raised in the deep south and joined the army when he was 19, but one night he vanished. He was declared AWOL, and eventually he was declared missing, and later officially declared dead. However, 10 years later, a 7 foot tall man walked into a Virginia hospital ER in my part of the Midwest and said to the receptionist, My name is Marion Deshed, and I've been dead for 10 years. And according to the Redditor, those were the last words he ever spoke to anyone. He had shown up to the hospital covered in dust and wearing an old uniform that he'd been wearing the night he vanished. His social security had not been used at all, and he had no ID on him whatsoever. However, via fingerprints, they were able to identify him. The family was notified, but they said they had already grieved their lost man and that whoever was claiming to be him simply wasn't, and asked to never be contacted again. The nurse went on to add that Marion would pace all day, every day, moving his mouth in a way that looked like he was muttering to himself, but nothing came out when he moved his lips. He had an unnerving habit of throwing his head back with his mouth wide open as if he was laughing hysterically but not so much as a breath could ever be heard. The nurse said she tried talking to him almost daily, and he would appear to listen, but only reacts by periodically throwing his head back in that laughter mimicking way of his. Various medications and treatment plans were pursued, but nothing ever affected him. Therapy was tried as well, but all that would happen was Marion would just grin and start pacing again. She goes on to say that on her last day, she saw Marion pacing in the parking lot, throwing back his head to laugh. She closes by saying all those years she'd wondered, was he a ghost? And all those years later, she still doesn't know. Click through and listen to as many top 5 scary videos as your ears can handle. Moving on. Number 4. Things that go bunk in the night. Now you would never ever ever believe this, but our next story comes from Reddit as well. A similar thread, a similar question. What's the most paranormal thing you've ever experienced? Lots of good ones to pick from, but this one from Mad Rampager really stood out for me. I used to be in the military. The training camp bunk that we lived in was said to be haunted. Occasionally, our stuff would go missing and reappear in weird places, like under our bed or inside a bag that we'd zipped up and stuff. No big deal, right? Weird things happen, and I mean human error and all that. Well then came the instance that freaked everybody out. It was night, after lights out, and my friend was on his phone texting his girlfriend. Most of us had been drifting off to sleep and we were lying on our beds when suddenly my friend heard the shuffling of feet from the corridor. So, thinking that it was our sergeant, he quickly hit his phone under his pillow, rolled over on his side, and tried to get to sleep. What happened next still chills me to the bone to this day. While he pretended to sleep, he heard someone right behind him at the other end of the bed saying, don't worry, you can continue to pretend to sleep. I could have dismissed this as a figment of his imagination, except me and five other people around him heard it. Creepier still, there was no one there. And weirdly, it sounded like the voice of a young girl that had said it. For reference, our camp was in the middle of an island and was set up away from the main admin building. The island had been closed by the government for army training purposes for the past 15 years, so there were definitely no civilians around, let alone any children. To make matters freakier, when we came back from our weekend home leave, there was a bunch of hair on his bed, neatly bundled up, long and jet black, and underneath his pillow was a note. 
Remember me? Now as I said, we're in the middle of a forest, in the middle of an island, and at that point in time, there were no female recruits whatsoever on the island. Our bunks were locked for the weekend, and the duty sergeant had no idea what had happened. We never spoke about it again after that night and it still chills me every time I think about it. Number three, old friends. Our next story is from a Reddit thread asking, what's your ghost story? And I gotta point this one out just cause it was too funny, but the original poster included the title in brackets, serious, to deter any would be paranormal pranksters. Just serious ghost stories, please. Luckily, Redditors obliged. User Barbcats shared this terrifying tale. When I was 37, I went to my high school reunion. I flew into the nearest airport and rented a car. The distance was about 35 miles through a very rural and almost abandoned part of the country. About three miles outside of town, I see someone on the side of the road flagging me down. Up in the north woods, no one ever leaves someone else stranded, and it would turn out that the guy standing there was somebody I'd actually been to school with, my old friend Jim. Jim gets in the car and we start talking, catching up. I hadn't seen him in 20 years, but he still looked the same, maybe just a little bit older. We get to town and I ask him if he wants to come to the reunion with me and have a drink. He says no, just take me back home. Jim's parents had lived only a few blocks from my grandmother's and I turned in that direction, but he said to take him to the part of town that really was just the outskirts, up by the fairground and the cemetery. There was a mobile home park out there and I figured that must be where he lived. When we reached the end of the turn, he said just drop me off here. It was nice to see you again and he walked off into the night. So I went to the high school reunion, met up with some old classmates, and we start to talk. Now please understand me here. I am stone cold sober, nor do I ever take anything harder than soda. Tired after a 13 hour flight, but I was completely sober. As we were talking about who was showing up and who wasn't, I mentioned to my old classmate that I just picked Jim up a few miles off east of town and had dropped him up by the fairgrounds. Now for some reason everyone got really, really quiet. Even the guy belting out karaoke stopped and my cousin went white as a shirt. Barb. Jim died eight years ago. Rolled his car. I start to feel really dizzy and I go out to the car to take some deep breaths and decide whether or not I'm going crazy. And there on the seat was a newspaper printed eight years ago containing Jim's obituary. I still have that damn paper. Every now and again, I take it out to stare at it and I still wonder just what the hell happened that night. Number two, ghost on the line. The next story comes to us from a thread asking law enforcement officers of Reddit, what is the creepiest call that you've ever been on? We got a very creepy answer from user Smokey Bonaparte sharing this creepy little tale. The Redditor writes, 911 dispatcher calling in. We received a call from an elderly lady who had trouble breathing. I had taken several calls from her before and her husband in the past, so I recognized the voice. I dispatched an ambulance to her residence and held her on the line trying to keep her calm while the ambulance was responding. Ambulances advised that they had a 15 minute ETA as she was in a very rural part of West Virginia. I'm talking to her just about her husband and how she was doing and just making pretty standard small talk with her. The ambulance arrives and I let him know that she is in severe respiratory distress and I still had her on the line. I let her know the ambulance is coming to her door to go answer the door and she says okay and hangs up the phone. Oh that's pretty normal right? Well, here's where it gets very weird. The EMT and paramedic on scene call back about a minute after and they say that no one is answering the door. We have a sheriff in the area pulling on scene about that time. The sheriff unit confirmed the address and he's breaching the door to make access to the PT. Five minutes go by and the paramedic on scene radios to ask me who called. I tell them it was the elderly woman who lived on residence. He tells me he's going to call this in and he needs to speak with my shift supervisor. We get him over to the supervisor and the supervisor confirms the same information I relayed that it was all correct and asks what's going on. Apparently the old woman had been dead for a while and was already in full rigor mortis. They thought I was wrong on the caller, but the other dispatchers played it back for them and confirmed it was the old woman who called. The ambulance transferred the hospital and we got the same calls and disbelief from the doctors. But I took a call from a ghost that day. Number one, uninvited guest. Closing off our list is this story which chilled my spine like sub-zero. Coming to us from user parole model, which hey, by the way, love the pun. It was from an ask reddit thread asking, what's the creepiest thing that's ever happened to you? Lots and lots and lots of good ones, but this one took the cake. So lend an ear. I used to visit my friend at her house out in a rural farming area before she moved. I'd sleep over a lot and we'd just hang out and draw. 
I usually slept in the living room and on the couch, and there were two mirrors in the room that were fairly close to the TV. When the TV was off and I was walking by, I started seeing shadows move behind me. I thought it might just be something off the TV screen, and then one evening I walked into the living room to get my sketchbook so I could sketch in her bedroom. I bent over and picked it up, stood up straight, and I looked in the mirror and saw a man behind me. A man standing in the hallway leading to the living room. He was average height, bald, and a bit old. I turned to look at him and no one was there. I turned to look at the mirror again and he was gone. I felt more than a little spooked. Another time we were just sitting in the living room and we heard what sounded like a kid's footsteps running across upstairs quickly. She had two adult siblings but they were out at work leaving us all alone. Around that time I decided to sleep in my friend's room instead of the living room only to wake up in the middle of the night to see four posters slowly get peeled off the wall. No, it wasn't just them falling and dragging each other down. It looked as if someone was carefully unsticking the tape and removing them. The next morning my friend put them back up saying, well I need to get some better tape. She and her family eventually moved out because they couldn't afford to keep living there anymore. We would never really talked about anything that had happened in that house, as if talking about it might actually make it worse. But after she moved, I finally confronted her and said it. I said, dude, your house was haunted. I hope you knew that. She replied, yeah, we knew it was. Some guy and his granddaughter used to live there, but he took her life and then took his own. So it was probably them or something. I never told you because I didn't want to scare you. Later, she would dig out a copy of a news article she got from a local paper about the crime. The picture that went with the article was the exact man I saw all those years ago. Coming in number five, the St. Louis exorcism. I cast thee out, thou unclean spirit, along with the least encroachment of the wicked enemy and every phantom and diabolical legion. Sounds a lot more intelligent and intentional than the stuff I'm usually saying, right? Well, that's because it's a quote from this particular exorcism. Which exorcism is that, you may ask? What makes this one special and noteworthy? I figured I'd get this one out of the way off top, especially if we're talking about true stories scarier than The Conjuring. This is the exorcism that inspired a movie that began a wave of nationwide hysteria, convinced people it was cursed, and essentially pioneered the demonic possession flick as we know it now. That's right, the St. Louis exorcism I so vaguely referred to in the title is actually the tale behind the exorcist. Holy smokes. So, now that we've got the prelude out of the way, let's talk about what makes this story so spooky. It's a wild one, that's for sure. Apparently there was a priest who had just finished up a year at Harvard that had recently returned home. He was hanging out in a residence known as Verhagen Hall where he had heard the most blood-curdling laughter. It was like a mixture between mad screaming and hysterical cackling. This, of course, drew some attention and brought people to check on the person making this noise. Turns out there was a 14-year-old boy behind this horrible cacophony, and thus began a deep investigation. At night, the boy would contort into different nigh-impossible shapes and scream out in tongues, making little to no sense and giving off the impression of being possessed by demons. Obscene words, phrases, and images would appear as raised welts on his skin, and at one point, an enormous X appeared on his chest. This could be interpreted as the Roman numeral for 10, which led the priests to believe he was taken over by 10 demons. As things got worse and worse for the boy, he started sustaining seemingly psychic injuries. He'd thrash and bleed and do awful things, but his heart rate never seemed to change. This is where that classic vomit scene was born. Apparently the boy would spit foul substances at the attending priests. I wouldn't be too surprised if the 360 degree head spin had roots here too. There were plenty of witnesses during this exorcism, but the whole ordeal has been scrutinized over the years. The details are questionable, but the story remains. It's hard to overlook something so iconic. Coming in at number 4, we've got the Panama Exorcism. Jumping way forward in time, this paranormal occurrence was a big news item in early 2020. This is a truly terrifying tale considering all the human suffering involved. In January of 2020, a large group of bodies was discovered in an indigenous area of Panama, supposedly all the result of a large-scale exorcism. All the victims and suspects were members of a local indigenous community. 
It seems that a small sect of people had banded together to rid the neighbors of what they considered demons. So there are two possibilities here. We've got the chance of a real demonic possession and the idea that it spread to 15 odd people. That is a massive demonic presence, one that folks likely would cower at the sight of. Most possessions seem to limit themselves to a single person, maybe a family at most, but 15 people. I don't know if a conjuring story would be able to begin covering all of that. Wild. However, there is the alternate tale, one that is just as, if not more, scary. There's the possibility that the sect of people performing these exorcisms weren't looking to rid their neighbors of demons. They could simply have been deluded and looking to cause some harm. When you hear that 15 people were kept locked away from the world, forced to undergo rituals with the pretense of cleansing, you might not immediately think of actual possession. Cult behavior might be more front of mind. While the details of the exorcisms themselves are foggy at best, and the true intent of the exorcists may never be known, there is a 100% possibility that this was truly terrifying for all involved. Coming in at number 3, we've got demons in Arkansas. With all sorts of strange ailments culminating in a fall from a second story window, this tale is complex and full of twists. A nurse with a history of running marathons, Amy Stamantis, was perfectly healthy before her experiences with supposed demons. Then out of the blue, she started acting strangely. She forgot how to do her job, she couldn't walk in a straight line, she couldn't even pick out her clothes in the morning. It worried the people in her life immensely, but they couldn't figure out what was going on. This behavior intensified over time, turning into things like screaming at former colleagues and disrobing at family events. Doctors couldn't find where this strange behavior was coming from, even though she was going to all sorts of different places to see if anyone could figure it out. The voices in her head proved to be too much, and she found herself falling from a second story window. Paralyzed and clinging to life, she was ready to give up. Then, during a prayer service for Amy, a Pentecostal evangelist noticed something was off. This woman had performed exorcisms, or something similar to exorcisms in the past, and claimed to see demons within Amy. She prayed over her and heard a growling from within. That sealed it, and she began an exorcism. Using anointing oils and prayers to God, this evangelist eventually flushed the demons right out of Amy. A happy ending for sure, but could you imagine going through that kind of possession and not knowing what was happening? Coming in number two, we've got the Winchester House. So get this, the folks who live here are convinced that the ghosts of people killed by the guns they manufactured haunt their house. Making deadly weapons has to weigh heavy on one's conscience, so I suppose this was an inevitability. Still, the amount of supposed ghosts and demons in this house is off the charts, so much so that they had to get really creative with the architecture. At some point, the heir to the Winchester Rifle Company, Sarah Winchester, decided to have a sprawling mansion built. It never seemed to be complete though. She would continuously bring in contractors to build new features and change up the old ones. Apparently, she wanted to confuse the ghosts of people killed by her family's rifles. I guess these ghosts came back with a vengeance at some point and found their way into the family home. So inside, there are plenty of different structures meant to keep the phantom spiraling. Stairways to nowhere, doors that open into walls, hallways that become labyrinths, and more. An alternate telling of the story has Sarah Winchester doing all of these wacky renovations because she wanted to be an architect. However, I like putting the stories together, where the budding architect has to battle the ghosts that have come back to get revenge for all of the lead pumped into them. The process of figuring out these apparitions were actually returning to the home of the person who started the rifle company that would eventually kill them is a spooky mystery waiting to happen all on its own. But adding in the spooky maze-like features to an old mansion? Tell me you don't want to learn more. And finally, at number one, we've got the Axe Murder House. Sounds promising, right? Located in Villisca, Iowa, this family home is considered one of the most haunted places in America. Back in the early 20th century, a family was mysteriously hacked to bits here. Someone broke in and chopped them up with an axe. Thus the name, the Villisca Axe Murder House. The culprit was never found, and to this day nobody really knows what happened here. This story has made for quite a reputation, and those who spend time here will back it up. Visitors claim that there's a dark paranormal power embedded in this house and are often willing to pay up the nose to attempt an overnight stay. More often than not, these visits are cut short. Demonic laughter has been reported, light fixtures have failed and fallen on people, and all sorts of household objects have been flung about. There's even the tale of a paranormal investigator who spent a night there and ended up stabbing himself before his time was through. Be careful and maybe reconsider spending time here. We'll keep telling the spooky stories so that you don't have to go and find out for yourself. 
Well, in unless you want to. But report back, I want details. Starting off fifth place strong, we've got a narrowly avoided death. This tale takes place when long-term nurse, Jenny, was placed in charge of caring for an elderly woman with no family who was admitted to the hospital when her husband passed away. She didn't speak often, but when she did, it was usually just words that made no sense together. Jenny felt bad for her because ever since she'd arrived, so many of the residents in her area that she, you know, seemed to enjoy spending time with had Past. She put up a picture of each of them next to her, the pictures of her husband and several others who were probably just family to remember them. Being an extremely empathetic person, Jenny felt sorry for this woman and strived to give her extra attention whenever she could and formed a bond with the lady. It just seems so unfair that she had, you know, such luck and kept losing people that she cared about. One day she looked at Jenny and said, plain as day, sweetie, I think I'm done now and handed Jenny a picture. It was a picture of Jenny and she smiled because it touched her heart she was so important to the old woman. She passed nearly a week later and poor Jenny cried for days from the loss. The old lady knew it was the end and she said goodbye as best she could. Now fast forward to just under two years later when Jenny was talking with a colleague and that old lady came up in conversation. Her colleague referred to the lady as that crazy um, uh, explicit word for a female dog which seemed very out of character for her and it shocked and offended Jenny deeply. She expressed this to her colleague, not so nicely, and the lady looked at Jenny with a shocked look and said, oh dear. Do you not know? And then proceeded to explain something to Jenny that uh, she in fact hadn't known. As it turned out, it came out sometime after she had passed that the old lady had killed her husband by poisoning him and that there was an investigation because it appeared that she had a ritual of befriending someone, obtaining a picture of them, and hiding the picture until she could kill them usually by poisoning, and then displaying the picture as some sort of a trophy. It was suspected that this may have been the reason for the spike in mortality rate during her stay and the considerable amount of photos in her collection. The last Jenny heard, the old family photos weren't any relation to the old woman, and the police were trying to ID the individuals and compare them to several cold cases. Sheesh. Thank goodness Jenny survived to tell the tale. In fourth place, time to tell the tale of a rocking bed. Nope, not a rocking horse, rocking chair, or you know, like an ottoman. A bed. I know a lot of beds are out of style and like a major safety hazard, but maybe this could inspire them to come back. New nurse Demi was working one of her first ever overnight shifts when a relative of one of her patients raced into the nurse's station out of breath, screaming that she needed to come quick. Unable to elaborate, saying Demi had to see what she was talking about for herself. Our nurse made her way to the room in question, where this little old lady patient was crying and holding onto the bed for dear life, all while her bed was shaking extremely violently. Now, you're probably thinking that the lady was the one causing all that shaking, but apparently she was this like frail, practically emaciated older lady who didn't even possess the strength to like rattle the rails. The ward only had two other patients in it, and everyone in there was huddled in a corner, shaking in fright until it eventually subsided. Apparently that particular ward was rarely used, and the bed that the old lady was in was used even less. People who have laid in it complained of nightmares where they hear screams and laughter of angry children. I guess some restless spirit called dibs in that particular bed, and Demi would very much like it to uh, pick somewhere else to hold court. Please and thanks. In third place we have the case of Purple Scrubs. Former EMT David O'Keefe worked mainly in transfers, and this particular client was always his last one of the day, having to return home late at night in the dark. She was an older woman who visited the hospital he was based out of for regular dialysis treatment. One specific day, she was being moved, and David was sitting in the back of the transport vehicle with her. She looked under the weather, so he asked what was wrong out of concern, and she said a man in purple had been visiting her. He asked if the man was, you know, like a relative or a technician, but she shook her head. She said the man would sit next to her during dialysis appointments and stroke her hair. Thinking this was strange, right after he dropped her off at the hospital, David asked the hospital techs about you know such a person, but no one had seen or remembered anyone wearing purple. Visitors also weren't really a thing at this part of the hospital, so he assumed the patient was just imagining it. While he was waiting to bring her back home, he saw the man in purple scrubs waiting outside that woman's room, watching her door. As David went to approach him, a bunch of tech personnel urgently ran past them into the woman's room, and David lost sight of the man. It turned out the woman in the room had suffered a heart attack and was sadly unable to be revived. Oh, and just a like tiny creepy footnote, none of the staff in that hospital wore purple scrubs. In second place, we have a mystery mimic. Yeah, I'm fond of alliteration. How can you tell? This spooky story comes to us courtesy of former late night transportation worker, Betty. She worked the position for a few years, but after this incident, did everything possible to never work a nighttime shift ever again. The transport home base was in the basement of the hospital, where all laundry was done and all supplies were sorted and housed. On this particular night, Betty was the only one in the basement when she heard whistling at the end of the hallway by the elevator and poked her head around the corner expecting to see her only co-worker on duty that night, but there was absolutely no one there. And so, 
she shrugged it off. That night in particular was slower in pace, so she opted to take a snack break and veg in the break room for a bed. When she heard a loud bang out of nowhere, Betty walked into the hallway and a bed was rolling down the hall, bumping into the sides of the walls. Now at this point, she assumed that her coworker was playing a prank on her, and she directly radioed him to chew him out but he swore he was upstairs. Honestly, I'd be assuming the same. I've had a similar situation in a haunted house I used to work in at an old theater, but Betty was smart about it and determined to catch her coworker in the act. She started walking down the hallway and as she passed the laundry room, all the machines started up. She poked her head in, expecting to find him, but the room was completely empty. Just a tiny worrisome spooky flag, nothing to worry about, right? As she walked into the laundry room, the machines came to a complete Stop. Betty froze at first before regaining her senses and making her way towards the elevator when she heard whistling from the other end of the hall. Now at this point she's certain that she's the only worker in the basement and is repeatedly pressing the elevator buttons in an attempt to like rush it. As she was waiting for the elevator, things started falling off the shelves down the hall. Betty could only stare in shock as boxes of gloves, tissues, and packages of tubes fell off various racks one by one. Her entire body broke out in goosebumps, every hair standing on its end, and the feeling of being watched had completely consumed her thoughts. When the elevator finally arrived after what seemed like forever, Betty felt the sensation of someone brushing her arm and screamed in panic. Upon exiting the elevator upstairs, she made a beeline for the cafeteria where her coworker actually was and broke down explaining the entire ordeal. Now, before y'all ask, but Alexa, how was this spirit a mimic? Turns out that Betty usually whistles to herself at work at night, chats with the laundry folks during daytime shifts, and the items that fell off the shelf slowly were common items that she would have to retrieve. Yeah, big note for me on this one. In first place, we have terrified security staff. Security guard Mason claims that while he wants his location to stay anonymous, he used to work overnight security in one of the largest, best, and oldest hospitals in the USA. He and his fellow security officers all have stories about one building in particular, which was built in the late 1800s and was the original psychiatric building for this hospital. Now, being the late 1800s, not much was truly known about psychiatric disorders at that time. On top of that, this hospital was known for its medical research. Sadly, with what we all know about history, when you combine the two, that spells out a lot of nightmares. A couple years before Mason started working security there, this building in particular had been converted partially into offices after the newly built part of the hospital had dedicated a section for the updated psych ward. Mason's rounds for the first night of our tale happened to include, yep, you guessed it, that building. At night, this building was empty due to most of the staff who worked in those offices leaving by 5 p.m. every day. Apparently some folks like to rush home, which is fair, but they would leave their office doors unlocked, which was a big no-no due to medical information being located in their offices. Big confidential stuff. I don't want to keep that locked up. It was security's job to go to each floor, make sure every door was locked, and if it wasn't, to secure it themselves. Mason did his initial sweep of the building to make sure it was clear of people, and then proceeded to do door checks. The hallways were pretty narrow, so he could check both sides of the hallway's doors at once. At the end of this hallway, there were two sets of doors he had to go through to reach the final office, which was a dead end, so he had to come back out, go the other way. He noticed everything was secure, so he was ready to move on to the next floor. He exited the two sets of doors from the dead end office and froze at what he saw. Every door that he had already checked was completely ajar and set so perfectly so that their own weight wouldn't cause them to shut again. A single wheelchair had appeared at the end of the hallway and was facing towards the steps. Mason had heard other security officers outright reject that set of rounds due to the strange stuff that was happening, but he originally laughed it off until that night. He went around and forced the now open door shut and tried to shrug it off. Nothing else weird happened that night and he returned the next night to patrol the miners ward. The area was just under construction, so security was needed to make sure nobody got hurt by accident and all the workers were doing their job. Safety first. When Mason was hanging out in the break room before his shift officially started, other security guards were discussing various reports of seeing a young human with brown hair who would disappear randomly, and Mason dismissed this as just gossip meant to spook off the newbies. An hour into making his rounds, a foreman who had stayed late called security and asked for a security officer to come up because, quote, a youngin with brown hair had locked himself in a room and he didn't want him to get hurt with all the open wires in there. Mason answered the call, went and unlocked the door for the foreman, and looked in a 20 by 8 room for about 10 minutes, and upon seeing no one, 
called it in as a false alarm. He attempted to shrug it off until he received a call for backup in the psych ward, and when he arrived, he noticed the patient was in a state of panic near the remnants of a shattered chandelier. Now, before he had experienced the abnormal happenings in this building, Mason claims he would have written off his testimony as idiocy. But the patient claimed that something held him in that spot as the chandelier started swinging wildly until it started to fall. When it started to fall, he was let go and allowed to move and scrambled out of the way before it hit him. Now, this was the beginning of the end for Mason, who requested to be transferred to hospitals the next day. And as much as I love the Phantom of the Opera, I don't really want it to become reality. One of my favorite things to say in accordance with that is that I love one fictional toxic tenor, and only one. Emphasis on fictional. Number five, the Trans Allegheny Asylum. Built in the Civil War era in West Virginia, this asylum was designed to house around 250 patients, but ended up housing more than 2,500 people. People locked in cages, lobotomized with ice picks, tied to the beds. It's safe to say that this place is a nightmare in itself. Since the asylum was briefly a Civil War military base and absolutely haunted to the core, people have spotted uniformed soldier ghosts strolling the corridors. Patients were previously admitted into the asylum for a variety of reasons, including asthma, laziness, egotism, and even greediness. This was a different time. This led to more and more patients being admitted, causing the asylum to overflow with staff and bedding. It is said that the most famous ghost is the presence of a small girl named Lily. She was either a former patient or a child of one of the housing staff or patients. Back then, it was very common for women to be admitted while pregnant. One thing's for sure, she spent her childhood and her afterlife stuck within these walls. Ghost hunters make contact with her spirit all the time, apparently. Staff members say that there are always toys strewn out on the fourth floor, and Lily's been known to move them around herself. Small balls rolling down the hallway on their own, running footsteps and voices can be heard playing with things on the floor. Lily is known for her loud laughter, as well as her interest in playing games with staff and visitors. Other experiences include dark shadows, objects moving on their own, disembodied voices and cries. This place is haunted, haunted. Today, the asylum is used as a historic and ghostly tour hotspot in which haunting stories combined with the decaying look of the structure creates the contrast that the asylum is well known for. The asylum itself was created with good intentions. It was meant to treat people who need to care, but soon it became misused and the people it originally meant to care for were horribly. After closing its doors for good in 1994, they reopened to educate and tell the tales of the patients themselves who lived and died within these walls. Number four, Danvers State Hospital. Located about 21 miles north of Boston, the hospital opened on May 1st, 1878, and the hospital's first patients arrived only days later. The inspiration for H.P. Lovecraft and Batman's Arkham Asylum due to its gothic look and its twisted patience. This asylum followed in the same footsteps of any classic mental asylum. It was only meant for about 500 patients, but ended up housing around 2,500. Low staff, no rooms, and of course treatments such as shock therapy and lobotomies. This asylum was the very first to operate the transorbital lobotomy, where an ice pick is inserted through the eye socket and into the brain. Ouch. The staff started to experiment with this new method on the elderly, mentally disabled, alcoholics, drug addicts, and insane criminals. The staff used treatments like shock therapy and lobotomies even when they didn't need to. Of course, due to the extreme methods of controlling patients and the push for science, patients started dying there, and their bodies were found days and months later. The cruelty just began. The doctors were using lobotomies to cure anything from daydreaming and backaches to delusions and depression. Visitors described how dirty the patients always looked, how they were creepily wandering the halls and sometimes even blankly staring off into space. Some of these patients weren't even suffering from anything, and the extremes of the treatments are what drove them insane. The asylum was of course shut down and its building demolished. Some patients left the asylum while others are spending eternity under its grounds. The asylum's buildings don't exist anymore, but its cemetery does. Danvers State Hospital closed on June 24, 1992 due to budget cuts within the mental health system. And the 770 patients who died at Danvers were buried in the numbered lots on the property with the hospital replacing traditional headstones with patient numbers. This is just one act of cruelty and dehumanization the hospital was known for. Number three, Rolling Hills Asylum. Located in Bethany, New York, Rolling Hills Asylum was established in 1826 as a poor farm or poor house which was an institution built by the government to house and maintain orphans, widowed women, the disabled, the mentally ill, and of course, children. The staff did their best to keep unsafe patients away from the general population, but problems soon ensued. As a result, a solitary confinement cell was constructed in the building, and those who lived there were often referred to as, quote, the inmates. 
In 2008, Kerry Kearns, the co-founder of Ghost Hunting Sea Pier, did an overnight public ghost hunt at Rolling Hills. Arriving around 4 p.m., we went to Rolling Hills to get some pictures during the day. The doors opened for the public ghost hunt at 9.30. There were said to be 50 people present during the ghost hunt, and there were two tour groups. We used devices such as digital audio recorders, video recorders with night vision, thermometer gauge EMFs, flash cameras, the works. A ghost box and sound amplifier were also present. We did catch some orbs in many pictures, with some being more impressive than others. What appears to be a mist or a smog coming out from behind the nurse's station door scared us. On film, on the second floor, doors of the solarium move on their own. Even shadows of people standing and walking behind the doors appeared. We also caught some EVPs with our digital audio recorders, with a voice of what sounds like an elderly lady screaming, quote, you, go away. When in the electrotherapy room, I had two episodes of sharp pain that lasted approximately one minute to the left side of my head and right above my eye. Twice in the electrotherapy room. Around 4 a.m., Mike and I traveled from the area of the organ room down to the second hallway and sat against the sides of the hall. While Mike and I sat there, I began to feel something touch and crawl up my right leg. As that happened, another shadow peeking from around the corner of one of the doors made us super uncomfortable. It was just staring at us. While investigating on the third floor, there were sounds of someone walking around. I felt the touch of a hand touch my face and a couple seconds later, one of the other investigators further down the hallway said she felt something holding her hand squeezing hard. I wonder what this mist was. Sounds like some Ghostbusters plasma right there. Number two, Penhurst Asylum. In October 2019, Ripley's Believe It or Not spent a night at one of the most chilling and gruesome asylums that ever stood. Penhurst Asylum in Pennsylvania has been called many things. Ghost Ward, the crazy kids, and of course, one of the most haunted asylums on earth. The team spent a night and had this to say about its history and their experiences. Penhurst's long history of misconduct of children, for example, used punishments such as the removal of children's teeth if they were labeled a biter. The employee's cruelty has been well documented over the years and is that of Dr. Jesse G. Fear, literally the worst name for a doctor. Chris Levine, an open-minded skeptic and Flip Searless, team leader, were just a few of the crew who spent the night with a variety of audio recording devices. Apparently the Echo Vox, which is a tool for investigators, started playing kids jingles. Quote, we were getting a lot of different children's songs, but the one on repeat was Pop Goes the Weasel. It was pretty terrifying because we heard kids singing along with the Echo Vox in the background. Flip had asked, can you see us? And the children's voice on the spirit box came back and said, yes. How do you see us? And the kid's voice said, as ghosts. As we head down into the basement, a prominent ghostly figure is waiting for us. The King. A menacing figure popular with the paranormal enthusiasts who visited Penhurst over her years. The King was a maintenance worker here from the 40s. His domain? The boiler room. He was not well and he was known to treat the patients cruelly. He's known to come across on EVPs as a large shadowy figure creeping around corners and he'll even touch you. Though they're uncertain if he's a poltergeist or demonic entity, he's come across with a creepy laugh. He told us his name, and the crew even had a full conversation with him. After listening to the ghost box recording, the team were nervous when they heard the king yelling, leave, leave, leave. We started on the right foot because I offered him a cigarette and asked him if he wanted to smoke. He said yes. Fast forward 10 minutes and he clearly did not want us in that room. He would just repeatedly yell, leave. That's horrifying. After asking what would happen if we didn't leave, the king's voice screamed, choke. Spooky. Okay. And coming in at number one, Waverly Hills. Opened in 1910 in Louisville, Kentucky as a two-story hospital to accommodate 40 to 50 tuberculosis patients, Waverly Hills earns its gruesome history from its tortured patients, ghastly medical experiments, and the infamous body slide, aka body shoot, aka the death tunnel, where the dead were transported down and collected at the bottom by a group of staff who would collect them to be cremated or buried. A true ghost tale has featured numerous stories by visitors to Waverly Hills Sanatorium. In one of these cases, an experience was of Mary Lee. She was a young woman who lived in the sanatorium while it was open. On September 10th, 2006, Tom Halstead of Missouri Paranormal Research took a photograph of a ghostly apparition that looked almost exactly like Mary. Some believe Mary is the nurse who hung herself in the haunted room 502, while others believe she contracted tuberculosis herself from a prolonged exposure to patients due to the sounds that they hear. 
mostly coughs. Whoever this mysterious woman is, she's been captured and feared for decades. Doppelgangers, also known as double walkers, are a type of spirit that mimic the appearance, voice, and mannerisms of anyone it encounters. At Waverly Hills, looking across the room and seeing the exact replica of yourself is pretty common. Even tour guides at Waverly Hills have reported seeing doppelgangers of themselves. And in some cases, the doppelgangers were almost identical except for gaping black holes where the eyes should be. Probably the most famous spirit at Waverly Hills is a little boy known as Timmy. Timmy was around six years old when he died in the hospital. Since he died with his whole life ahead of him, his spirit can't move on and he wanders the hospital in search of life. Visitors often bring toys or bring small balls for him to play with. And many claim that they see the balls bouncing on their own, slamming against the walls, or are whipped at high speed down the hallways. One thing's for certain, this place is one of the most haunted.